The Spanish-American War, and in particular the service of the armoured cruiser USS Brooklyn, prompted a brief flurry of dollar bills to issue from the US Treasury to fund further such vessels. The more immediate consequence of this was the six Pennsylvania-class armoured cruisers, the US going with the scaled-down pre-dreadnought approach to their designs, with a main battery of 8-inch guns and 6-inch secondaries laid out pretty much like contemporary battleships. However, other nations were building a wide variety of powerful armoured cruisers for their own purposes, and the US Navy wanted to keep up as long as the money kept on coming. But already Congress was beginning to put the brakes on. The US designers knew they wouldn't get away with anything larger, and anything smaller would of course be a retrograde step. So they aimed to try and achieve a more powerful ship on roughly the same displacement as the preceding ships, something that was locked in when Congress capped future armoured cruisers at 14,500 tonnes. Whilst this would have the advantage of theoretically allowing the two classes to operate together, rebalancing the design would mean some sacrifices. As one of the main aims was to increase firepower, and speed couldn't be dropped without skirting uncomfortably close to some of the faster battleships of the time, this meant armour had to become thinner. Although to try and minimise this, the location of the major weapons was adjusted to allow a smaller area to be covered, which would allow the reduction in plate thickness to be only slight, although the height of the protection would be increased as a result of evaluations of weaknesses in the previous class. Upgrading the main battery to 10-inch guns was accompanied by an idea to implement a 7-inch secondary battery, which was the largest gun with a shell that could be loaded by hand. However, the weight demands of this needed too much armour to be dropped, and the ships would end up being built with a main battery of four 10-inch guns in a pair of twin turrets, one fore, one aft, and a secondary battery of 16 single 6-inch guns in a mixture of casement and gallery mounts, eight per side a tertiary battery of no less than 22 single 3-inch guns across two decks, with some set up for turning into land-based artillery, was complemented by 3-pounder and 1-pounder guns along with 30 calibre machine guns. Finally, four submerged torpedo tubes, one in each direction, completed the armament. The ships could move at 22 knots, courtesy of a pair of screws supplied by vertical triple expansion engines yielding 23,000 indicated heart horsepower, somewhat more than the previous class on account of the slightly greater weight and wider hull that therefore necessitated a bit more power for the same speed. Armour was a mix of new Krupp style steel in the thickest portions and older formulas used in thinner areas. The main belt had a maximum thickness of 5 inches with 9 inches of armour on the turret face and a deck that was 1.5 inches thick in flat areas and 3 inches on the curved sections of the turtle back which formed the standard deck armour layout of ships of this period. Four ships would be built, Tennessee, Washington, North Carolina and Montana, the latter being the last time that that particular state would successfully get a ship named after it during the age of steam and steel. Although only armoured cruisers, their size, power, and overall the low number of capital ships in the US Navy meant that they, like the Pennsylvanias, would receive state names, at least for now. The first two were laid down in 1903 and entered service in 1906, whilst the latter two were laid down in 1905 and entered service in 1908, with a number of small modifications to their design. Although very powerful, they were just finding their feet when the launch of the Invincible class sounded the death knell for the armoured cruiser type as a whole, and the coffer doors were closing in any case, meaning that although a number of follow-on designs, including true battle cruisers, were inspired by them, no further large US cruisers would be built for almost two decades. Whilst refitted on occasion, the ships would lose both their names and their secondary and tertiary batteries over the course of World War I and immediately thereafter the former to free up the designations for battleships and the latter to supply guns to other ships, and because many of the mountings were pretty washed out in most seas anyway. Although the armoured cruiser was generally held to be pretty dead by the end of World War I, the US Navy lacked any recently built cruisers and so the Tennessee class was retained. Once the Washington Naval Treaty was signed, despite their age, it was felt that their legacy displacement, which was almost 50% greater than anything that could now be built, might allow them to be modernised to a competitive standard by replacing their twin 10-inch turrets with triple 8-inch turrets, as well as installing new oil-burning machinery to get them into something around the high 20s of knots. 
However, all the other additional costs, such as anti-aircraft guns, a torpedo defense system, etc., added up to almost as much, or potentially even more, than a brand new Pensacola or Northampton class cruiser, which would be faster and far more heavily armed, even if the older ship would, in theory, have thicker armor. As a result, the three surviving ships, now named Seattle, Charlotte, and Missoula, were gradually phased out of service and scrapped during the 1920s. The last ship, Tennessee, now Memphis, had suffered a rather unusual fate during World War I, being driven ashore and wrecked by either a tsunami or a massive storm surge caused by a hurricane in August 1916, whilst anchored off Santo Domingo. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.